Thank you all for joining. The webinar will begin at 12. Thank you for joining. The webinar will begin in about a minute. Good afternoon, I'm Talina Barker with the Ben Chamber. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this important conversation today. We'll be hearing from four different experts regarding homelessness in Central Oregon. Who is homeless and why? What resources are currently available? And what can we as a community do to meet the greatest needs? But before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. First of all, a heads up, we are hosting a webinar noon this Thursday on accessing the most recent round of stimulus funding, particularly the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Secondly, our Business Resource Needs Survey re remains open through the end of the day tomorrow. You'll find a survey link at benchamber.org. Please take just a few minutes to let us know what your business's greatest needs are for education and expertise. I'd also like to thank today's presenting sponsor, Ben Broadband. Their continued support allows us to provide this webinar to the community at no charge. We do have a full agenda today, but plan to keep plenty of time available for questions at the end. Please place your questions for panelists in the Q&A box accessible at the bottom of your screen. And with that, let's get started. 
Our first speaker is Carolyn Egan, Economic Development Director for the City of Bend. Thank you for being here, Carolyn. Thank you, Delina, and thank you everyone for um, tuning in today. I am so pleased to be here with actually three experts in homelessness. Um, I'm just lucky to be on the panel with them. Um, I know many of you, I serve as the city's economic development director, um, and many of you are familiar with the housing aspect um, that we have and the leadership role we have around getting more deed restricted affordable housing on the ground in Bend. Um, but moving into homelessness is um, an area where we are getting tugged um, by our community. And so wanted to make sure that um, we just had some basic language and some understanding um, today and then move into really the bulk, the bulk of the conversation. So I'm gonna share my screen and it worked earlier. So we're hoping it was shared now. Um, so thumbs up, are we seeing the, the working? All right, so what I really, thanks John. So what I really wanted to make sure everyone understood is that the purpose today is really to just share um, some of the basics about what is homelessness and who in our community is experiencing homelessness really with the goal of saying, we're really not gonna have effective solutions until we have better understanding um, of the current services of the current population um, and what we're already doing um, and what some of the barriers we wind up facing as we think about how do we create more or better solutions um, to address homelessness. So no surprise, the overview really, what is homelessness? Um, whenever we're talking um, about a topic, it's good to make sure we're all operating from the same definitions. We have some numbers for you about those who are experiencing homelessness in Central Oregon. Um, and then John and um, Colleen are gonna take it away and talk more about the services, the existing services that we have in Central Oregon for those experiencing homelessness. And then Sherry's gonna help us understand what some of those missing pieces are. Um, and why um, maybe why we're not being as successful as our community would like us to be in addressing homelessness. And then as Selena said, um, definitely time for questions and discussion. Um, we have some guidance on the ways that you can get involved, um, but you'll probably come up with your own suggestions as you, as you learn more about the issue. So what's homelessness? Um, this is really important because you will actually hear um, advocates and professionals um, who work in this space talk about literal homelessness. And it almost feels like they added a word to homelessness, but um, the housing and urban development, so the department of the federal government actually defines homelessness. Um, and it really talks about those who don't have a place to sleep um, or the place that they're sleeping is would otherwise be uninhabitable. So their car or the street, um, or they're staying in a shelter or they're staying in some sort of transitional housing. Um, they really don't have the means or the resources um, to pay for their own overnight um, housing. Um, and they may even be staying in a hotel, but it's being paid for by um, a government organization or by a charitable organization. So that could be like your local church. Um, we also really care about those who are at sort of what we call imminent risk of homelessness. And those who really are in the next 14 days won't have a place to sleep that's safe um, and be forced to stay in their car or go to a shelter um, or make a different decision about housing that may not be safe for them. Um, we also think about those who are um, don't have a safe place to stay or don't have their own place to stay. They may be staying with friends, they may be staying with family, um, but that's not really something that they can, they can count on beyond the end of the week or beyond the weekend. Um, and they also may be staying there at, at the risk of their own safety. Um, so some of the things when we talk about defining ho homelessness really starts to get into things we don't wanna talk about. Um, so those who are high school students in our schools who may be staying with friends because it's not safe to stay with parents, but under what conditions are they being allowed to stay with friends um, or other adults who may or may not be the best adults for them to be staying with in order to have a safe place to stay. Um, and we really also need to think about those who are fleeing violence. Um, we tend to think about those who are fleeing domestic violence. Um, and we did just have a case, a story that I just heard, a family left a different part of Oregon um, to come to Bend fleeing domestic violence. Um, and the only place we had for them that was safe for them to stay was the warming shelter. Um, we could get them food and clothing and we could even get them a cell phone um, and get them the paper that we needed. But the only safe place we had for them to, to sleep at night um, was our warming shelter. So thank goodness we had the warming shelter. But when you start to think about um, you know, who are those, you know, what is homelessness and who are those experiencing homelessness? 
understanding some of these definitions um, will start to help you understand why we don't have a great number. You know, we, we can't always get our arms around every single student who's experiencing homelessness or every single member of every single family who may be experiencing homelessness. Um, and we're really careful when we talk about homelessness. Um, people aren't homeless. They're, they're people who are experiencing homelessness for a time in their life. Um, and so recognizing that just because you, you don't have a safe place to sleep for some point in your life, you are not you don't always have blonde hair, right? So um, you're born with blonde hair, you have blonde hair, you can be described as having blonde hair, but being homeless is actually a stage that you're experiencing in your life, not something that really describes you um, as a person. So you'll hear us talk about um, homelessness maybe a little differently throughout this presentation than you may have heard up till now. So what do we know? I mean, we have some information about those who are experiencing homelessness. What we know is that every year we do a point in time count. So Colleen and her team can talk more about that. that she, she's leading that effort. Um, but to count over the course of one night, how many people are experiencing homelessness. The last time we did the count was January of last year. So before COVID, can anybody even remember before January last year? Um, it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, but what we knew then was we, it, throughout Central Oregon, we had about a thousand people who we were able to count that night. Um, and you can kind of start to see the demographics of those, um, those individuals and families. And we're really careful to speak about households or individuals and families experiencing homelessness um, because you can see back to the definitions, um, when children are experiencing homelessness or adults with children experiencing homelessness, it really helps us understand, you know, what the services that family may need. So the new point in time count um, will, is being done um, right now, and we expect significant increases. So um, housing price is a contributing factor, um, COVID-related job losses are contributing factors, um, and so, and the other, other contributing factors are just the isolation um, that families and individuals are experiencing due to the um, measures that we've taken to stop the spread of COVID-19. Um, but what we do know is that, and even says right here is in the asterisk that these numbers that we have, we know is a severe undercount. So for example, the annual count that we do of all of the youth who are experiencing homelessness in just the Ben Lapine School District is over 300. Um, so if you were to take, you know, that 54 number that's on your slide and actually kind of weigh it to the 300 and then multiply that by the five school districts we have in Central Oregon, you can start to understand um, how much of an undercount some of these numbers are. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to John from, and I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to John. Um, and then um, my other panelists are going to talk more about the existing services that we have and some of the services we wish we had um, in our in our community. Hi, um, I'm John Lodice. I work for Shepherd's House Ministries. And the thing I'm doing right now that's most relevant to this webinar is that I'm involved in the Ben Winter Shelter where I'm sitting right now. Um, so what is a winter shelter and what's important about it? Well, wintertime in Central Oregon seems to be the time when the consciousness of mainstream society is highly raised regarding the homeless population, regarding people who are out on the streets, because I think there's a real increase in sympathy in empathy and concern for the plight of people who are out on the streets when we know it's really, really cold out there. And being really, really cold is something we all share with folks who are homeless. We're all outside in the wintertime, we can feel how cold it is. And when we try to imagine not going inside somewhere where we can get warm, and having to actually sleep all night in whether that that's cold, I think our humanity responds to that, right? So that's an important part, obviously, of the winter shelter. We're trying to save lives by having people get inside where they won't freeze to death. But there's another really important part of the winter shelter too, and we experience this every year in, in a growing way. The longer we run the shelter, the more we experience this. And having these shelters, opening up these shelters to people who for most of the year experience no shelter. They're out in the streets, they're out in camps, they're in their cars, they're completely on their own, sort of disconnected from the rest of society, happily going about its business. They find that there's a place where they actually can belong, at least for a while. And that's a great opportunity for us because when we provide a place 
to belong to people who spend most of their lives feeling like they don't belong anywhere, that's a great opportunity for connection and relationship and for making some progress in encouraging people to help themselves and to let us help them at the same time. So, but here's the challenge. At the same time, our winter shelter is providing a place to belong. To make the shelter practically operate, we have to impose all of these boundaries and restrictions that allow the place to run on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're always coming into conflict with those two things because we're trying to welcome the guests. But at the same time, there's a lot that we're doing that limits the normal day-to-day -day activities of the guests at, at once. So with that sort of context in mind, I wanna talk about the brick and mortar of a winter shelter. I get asked every year when we're looking for space for a winter shelter, what do you need? What kind of space do you need? And so the answer is usually, here are some elements, here are some basic physical elements. We need adequate space where a certain number of people can lie down for the night and sleep. Right now, our building is a 10,000 square foot building. And we've been told basically, we know we can fit fairly easily 60 people. We intend to fit more than that if really bad weather requires, but you get the idea, 10,000 square feet, 60 people, maybe more. That gives you some idea. We need a structure, obviously, that has integrity. I mean, it has to have four solid walls, a roof, a good floor. Basically, it has to provide a sense of enclosure and security where we're keeping our guests. We need adequate heat because, obviously, that's a warming shelter. You want to be warm. We need adequate restrooms, and we need a kitchen or some area where we can stage meal service in order to feed our guests. Then there are some working aspects to a, a winter shelter too. So we need a check-in area where we can have entrance control, where we know who's coming in and out of the building and we can guard and control who's coming in and out of the building because that's an important safety element. Uh, we need some staff office and working area so that we can do what we need to do. We need some storage for our equipment and supplies. Uh, we need storage for guest items, especially guest items left behind because people come and go in winter shelters and a lot of personal items tend to accumulate. We also need a parking area for cars, for staff, for volunteers, for our guests, but also having a parking area around the building provides a little bit of a space buffer that can often increase safety uh, because it can keep unsafe. It gives us some warning when unsafe elements are approaching it also, truthfully, I'm just going to be honest here, it gives the public some sense of ease that there's some space buffer between the shelter and the rest of business that's going on in the neighborhood. Uh, this year, we have an extra challenge. We, we have one challenge we have every year, which is fire regulations. So on the one hand, we're trying to fit everybody in. We're trying to increase, maximize the number of people that we can sleep but we have fire regulations that we have to watch out for. And that's a really, really important safety consideration. So we have to temper our, our goal of putting in a lot of people with our goal of having safe fire exits and safe areas where people can congregate if an emergency does occur and, and some, other, some other elements of fire regulations. And of course, this year we have COVID. So we've had to do physical distance. We have to have everybody wear a mask. Makes the check-in area very, very important because we have to monitor who's coming into the building. Have we taken their temperature? Are they wearing a mask? Uh, can we ask them the questions we need to ask? Can we observe if they're sick? And that's important. If we notice somebody coming in who's very ill, we'll probably end up calling an ambulance just to be on the safe side. So that's a complication we've had to deal with as well. It's also affected the way we serve meals because of distancing. We don't have any community tables where people are congregated. We serve meals individually on trays to each one of our guests. And we ask our guests to stay in their sleeping areas while we do that. And we ask our guests to immediately put on a mask anytime they have to move about the shelter and they're leaving their immediate area. So these are all complications that we're facing this year with COVID. We hope we don't have to do that again next year. So let me come back to the theme of a place to belong. How do we make a place that sounds that complicated? A place where our guests feel like they belong, a place where our guests feel like they're welcome. Um, the first thing 
that I did when I was setting up the shelter was figure out what an individual sleeping area would look like. And this year at this shelter, everybody has a cot, everybody has a comfortable sleeping pad, everybody has a chair where they can sit either to eat their meal or do something else. Everybody has two totes, one for their bedding to keep their clean bedding in a tote and one where they can keep personal items, especially if they don't wanna carry them during the day and they're coming back that night. Now, these are all practical. There are practical reasons for having all of these, but giving each guest their spot and giving them items that are geared for their comfort, geared for their convenience, geared for their personal use, that adds a sense of belonging. And we have a lot of guests who come night after night after night. The first thing we do when we check people in is we check in the people who have stayed the night before. And I would say about 80% of the people who come each night have stayed the night before. So we're establishing a sense of continuity. And what happens when they come and they've stayed the night before, they can just have their same sleeping spot. It's there waiting for them. So it is kind of like coming home for them. And it's coming home to a place where people are, they're not just seeing to their survival. They're not just saying, we don't want you to die in the winter. We're, we're, we're trying to care for them at a higher level than that. Um, then we serve them a meal and it's a meal that's generously and cheerfully served. And that even though everybody's in their individual spot, it's kind of a communal time in the shelter because there are, there are either staff or volunteers going around and handing out trays and talking to our guests. And there is a sense of community in the middle of doing that even though it's more one-on-one -on -one than a group uh, activity. Uh, we're maintaining peace for rest by having distancing, by having comforts for sleeping, by having certain limitations in place that uh, make the, the shelter a quieter, more peaceful place. That's giving our guests the dignity of rest. And I think that's really important. And then in the middle of all these rules and all these procedures and all of these things that we have in place, we never want to approach them with rigidity. We never want to say, see, we've got this here written on paper. That's the way it's going to be. We also, we say that we want to do it with grace. We don't want to do it with rigidity. And the importance to that is that we're not treating the guests as a logistic that we have to deal with. We're treating them as a person. And if we're really doing our job well, we're treating them as a person that we're on an equal level with. And what is really important there is our interaction with them is as valuable to us as, as it is to them. We're getting as much out of the work we do with them as they are getting out of coming to the shelter and getting the services we provide. And if we are getting that feeling, then we're doing our job right. Um, and really important, when we give grace, when we talk to them about their individual situations, when we're willing to make allowances to all these rules that we think we've set up ahead of time, we're showing that they're not an unwanted person. We're not just trying to figure out how to deal with them. We're actually trying to relate to them, to, to look at their personal situation. And we're willing to make allowances to what we wanna do in order to accommodate them. And that I think is a really important basis for relationship. So I think there was a question I was told ahead of time. So what can people do to help with shelters? And I think the really important thing that people can give is their time. And you can give your time as volunteers. You can volunteer at the shelter. You can help to serve meals. It's actually as easy as just showing up because we are so used to having volunteers we haven't met yet just show up at the shelter because they've been arranged ahead of time. We know the drill, basically. We know how to guide people through what they need to do. And the work itself it's very simple. The work itself really isn't any different than being at home. You're just relating to a different group of people when you're doing it. You're serving meals, you're making people comfortable, you're making people feel at home, however, you're getting to know them. Um, and then we have donations of clothing and hygiene items. Um, and uh, they're all basic household items that people use in their houses every day, except we make them available to people who otherwise are out on the streets. Uh, and that dedication of time, that's part of the message. That's part of the message that our guests are welcome, our guests belong, and the time that we spend with our guests are valued because people are coming to the shelter in order to have time to spend with the guests. We had a night not too long ago when we had 10 different volunteers show up to serve dinner. 
whenever that happens, it's great. It, you can really just feel the positive atmosphere when our guests see that there are 10 people willing to show up just to feed them. That sends a really powerful message that they are valued and that they do belong and that they are welcome. And they're not just folks we're hoping you know, we, we, we don't have to encounter too much or, or, or that won't be in our way. And I say that, and I don't mean that as a jab, but the reaction, usually the strong emotional reaction I get with a guest when I'm trying to deal with them comes from that place, that place of all day long, they feel like they're not wanted wherever they are. And there's a really heightened sore spot, a really heightened sensitivity that comes from that. So... Um, I don't know where I am on the eight minutes, but. John, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing and for your remarkable work. We really, truly appreciate you. Okay. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Colleen Thomas, who is our Deschutes County Homeless Service Coordinator. Colleen, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And thank you for everybody for being a part of this call and the work that all of you do in our community and to be able to be present in today's conversation to open and hopefully change some perspectives and uh, gain knowledge of, of the experiences that those in our community are facing day to day. Um, so I'm here to kind of just talk about what some of the resources are. I wanna highlight a few things, uh, both what John uh, mentioned and as well as Carolyn. So um, Talina, as you mentioned, I am the Homeless Services Coordinator for Deschutes County Health Services, and I work directly with individuals experiencing literal homelessness that have a severe and persistent mental illness. Um, so through that, we are able to connect with indiv individuals in the community and to really just meet them where they're at. They're, that's a really important piece of the work that we do as service providers, especially with those that are experiencing homelessness. I think it's really important to highlight that every person that experiences homelessness is an individual. Um, when we look in, at resources and solutions to end and um, address homelessness, it's not a blanket statement. We need to look at the, the perspective of those that are experiencing homelessness as individuals. Um, and it's really important for all of us to understand that um, those that are experiencing homelessness in our region, whether that is the city of Bend or, you know, across central Oregon, that um, it might be the person that's your barista at your coffee shop, or it might be the person that's panhandling on the corner, that homelessness doesn't have, even though Carolyn did such a good job at outlining what our you know, government and certain entities define homelessness as is that it's not a blanket statement for all of those individuals. So I really hope that part of this conversation today and hopefully we can answer some questions that you might have in the Q&A of changing that perspective that we all deserve to be treated with dignity and respect um, despite whether we have four walls, running water and a roof over our heads, that home can be defined by many different uh, ways, whether that is a tent or four walls and running water. Um, so again, I just wanted to kind of highlight that. And as John discussed, you know, with the warming shelter that we have here in the city of Bend, many of you on this call might be aware that it, it, every year um, we are unfortunately put in the place of trying to find a location, trying to find a location for warming shelter throughout this winter season. It's not a position that any of us wanna be in and it's what we're working diligently year round to address. It's important for us as service providers and as a community to look at making sure that those that are experiencing homelessness or at risk for homelessness have a safe place that they can be. And it's not just in the winter, it's a year round issue that we face. Um, so in Deschutes County and across central Oregon, we have a limited uh, amount of resources for those experiencing homelessness. We have limited shelters for year round. And then we're, again, as I mentioned, and as John highlighted, we are faced with trying to find location for warming shelter each year. Through the continuum of care, the Homeless Leadership Coalition, which serves Desch Crook, Deschutes, Jefferson, and Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, we receive certain funding through the federal government to provide resources for those experiencing homelessness. Some of that includes rapid rehousing dollars that work with individuals to get into housing um, and support them through that transition. There are programs that are starting to get up and running for a housing first model um, to serve those that are chronically homeless um, and might have underlying mental health issues to find permanent supportive housing. Um, we have 
outreach services. Um, so many wonderful people, especially on this, I know, noticed on this call uh, that are directly providing outreach services to those experiencing homelessness. That's a huge piece. You know, when we look at funding, and I know, sure, you might highlight this as well, but when we look at funding, there's a lot of brick and mortar funding that's out there, but at the heart of it is we don't have the service dollars. We don't have as many dedicated and um, compassionate individuals, as John mentioned, that we need to provide services to those experiencing homelessness. It takes a village for us all to be able to address homelessness in our community, and part of that is we need more funding. So we're working you know, diligently with our elected officials to, to identify that funding and to be able to allocate that across our region so that we can see a decrease instead of that 10% increase as Carolyn mentioned in our point in time count last year, we wanna see a decrease. We all wanna do that. Um, but we also know that the data that we have um, as Carolyn shared the point in time count which is an annual count of individuals experiencing literal homelessness one night in January each year which um, we'll be kicking off this week. I'll get, highlight that a little bit. But the importance of, for all of you to understand is that when we have data, it's just a snapshot of the greater population of those experiencing homelessness in our region. The point in time count is our one of our uh, main resources for collecting data, and it's a completely voluntary um, survey. And it's really hard for us as service providers that already are stretched really thin to continue to connect and work with those individuals and have them complete a survey that has negative connotations to it. So while we continue to raise the awareness and educate the greater population of what that point in time count is, um, there's still some fear around that. So for those of you that don't know the point in time count, we will be kicking that off tomorrow, January 20th, and we'll be counting for nine days. Um, which is a little different in COVID days. Um, so we are trying to extend um, that opportunity so that we can connect with as many individuals because it's really important that that funding, the numbers, the data that we submit to HUD, the Housing Urban Development, is what impacts the greater um, allocation of funds to our region. So we, again, are trying to raise that awareness and educate the greater population um, that there's a need for more. There's a need more for more resources, a need for more compassionate people in our community to change the perspectives that we all have in our area that we all deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and that we need more locations and more resources for those that um, are experiencing homelessness in our region. Um, so with that, I'm gonna, Sherry, if you, or Talina, thank you. Do you want me to jump in, Talina? That sounds great. First, thank you, Colleen. We really appreciate all of that information and your time with us here today. Sherry, we'll, we'll pitch it over to you. Okay. First, I wanted to start out with some thank yous. Thank you to the Ben Chamber for highlighting this. Uh, this is a non-traditional topic for a uh, chamber to highlight, and I think that's really important to start out with. I want to thank John and Colleen and Carolyn for their passion and uh, their work to really highlight this. And then I want to thank a few people that are really good advocates. Uh, Gwen from the Bethlehem Inn, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Inn, and Morgan from First, First Presbyterian, JW and Karen from Covo, and Eric and Sam from Ben Heroes Foundation. Um, I know that they're not here, and James Cook also from the HLC. Um, there's a lot of people behind the scenes that are working diligently to help move this along and help the people that, who are in our homeless population. And so I wanted to start out before I said anything um, with some thanks, because I have a lot of gratitude for everyone that does this hard work. It's not easy work, um, and it really is necessary work, and hum it makes it much more of a uh, humanitarian aspect to have such great dedicated people. Um, when we talk about the homeless population, we do it in just that way. We talk about the homeless population. And today I really want to challenge everybody to not talk about the homeless population as a population, but rather individuals. These are individual people that have ended up in a circumstance for individual reasons. And one of the things that I think is um, the hardest and makes doing this work the hardest is that if we look at people as if everybody ended up here because they were addicted to drugs or are mentally ill, or our rental rates are too high, um, we're doing the population and the individual people a disservice. They 
ended up here by many different circumstances. So I want to talk to you about a few people that I met when I volunteered in the warming shelter um, uh, last late last year. I met a gentleman and I'm changing their names um, just for um, you know, not, not uh, keeping it private, but we're gonna call this gentleman John. And John was a convicted felon and he served his time and he can't find an apartment uh, because people don't rent to convicted felons. And so I went over and had a conversation with him because he was playing chess. And so he was playing by himself. And I went over and asked him if I could join him. And he carries around a backpack everywhere he goes. And inside that is his chessboard and his book. And the book is uh, famous chess matches that he plays out uh, by himself so that he can have space and uh, time to himself. And that's what he learned um, to fill his time in prison. But now he is trying to find a, an apartment that will rent to him and has a lot of struggles. And that is pretty common amongst people who have served their time. Sue was a woman who is trying to care for her aging mother. Um, her mother is a senior citizen and has some health issues, um, walks with a cane, and as well as trying to care for her son who goes to school. And so this is a three generation uh, family that ends up in the warming shelter because with the mother's ailing, uh, the grandmother's ailing, Ill uh, ailing illnesses and the son's um, needs for schooling, they just can't find a place where the, the mom in the middle, the second generation can afford a, a house in Bend. And so that is Sue. And then we have Bob who is a veteran and he keeps to himself and is incredibly tidy and likes to read his books in the evening. And I had a great conversation with him about what book he was reading. And he was so grateful and thankful to have a warm meal. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Jeff, which is a new population that I think um, is emerging. And Jeff has a minimum wage evening job, um, but cannot make enough wages to find an apartment. And so he is being pushed out of um, a home just by the price increases that we're seeing and the lack of inventory in our rental market. Um, and then I wanted to talk to you after, after making this a little bit more human and giving you a few stories, I wanted to talk to you about what, what needs to be done and what can we do. And after volunteering in the homeless shelter, I know it's not just socks, because I can tell you we had a lot of socks and we had a lot of mittens and we have a lot of generosity in our community, but we need to have a different type of generosity in our community. We can't just fix the problem with socks and gloves. And I know John needs socks and gloves at the shelter, so don't not bring those. Um, but just maybe take it up a level and a different notch to where you have a different type of commitment. We need time. We need volunteers. Uh, the biggest issue with getting the warming shelter up earlier was that we didn't have enough volunteers. And we had a man named David Melvin Savory who died on our streets in Bend. And we didn't have enough volunteers to get that shelter up and get people off of the streets um, immediately after that happened or before that happened and prevent that. And so we really need organized, dedicated volunteers. Maybe you're not the person that is able to serve a meal, but maybe you can help with volunteering and coordinating something else. And so we need um, time. We need place. We need people to say yes in my backyard. We need people to welcome shelters, welcome services. And when our neighbors say, can you believe this is happening? Say, yeah, I'm really glad that it's happening. I'm glad that we're doing something to help our homeless people. Have you met Sue and her three generation family that needs our help? Because I have, and I wanna help her. And so getting that place and space in our community is going to be very important. Another part of that is going to be redefining some of our public use spaces. We have many spaces that we heat and have space to have people sleep overnight, but we don't use them like that. Um, our courthouse halls are empty in the evenings and they're warm. Our school district has schools with gyms that are open that are warm. 
They're not used at night to house our homeless and have them leave in the morning. This, when I volunteered in the shelter, the shelter was full. So I set up a tent outside. While I'm looking outside the church, I'm looking at a school with a gym that's warm. We need to redefine those spaces. We need to find places for our homeless and we need support. And support, since I'm speaking to our business community, can be money. You can donate money to the Shepherd's House. You can donate money to Bethlehem Inn. You can donate money to the cause. And uh, Talina and Carolyn and John and Colleen will all have places to go. We also need funds, as Colleen said, from state and federal level to keep um, the shelters moving and more consistent and wraparound services. Um, and so that is going to be my concluding remarks because I know I've went over, um, but I wanted to get out a few of those thoughts. So thank you everyone for being on this call. This is a great first step to listening and your heart that drove you to be on this call. Um, find an action item that you can do to help with our homeless uh, population and find some people and their names and their stories. Thank you, Sherry. And I neglected to mention as we did that quick hot potato pass over, Sherry held as a former state legislator and she's also a local business owner here in town. You've probably been to her restaurant side ago at one time or another. So thank you for being here, Sherry, and showing that information. We'll go ahead and pitch over to questions now. And I'm gonna start here with the first question that came up on the list. And Carolyn, I think this one is for you. How close are we to make this shelter, the warming shelter that we have now, or any other location as a year-round shelter? Thanks, and thanks for the question. So one of the challenges um, in the city of Bend is we grew kind of fast. Um, for those of you who have been here, we went from you know, 25,000 to 100,000, what seems like overnight. Um, and in some places, we in fact still have development code that thinks we're still 25,000 people. Um, and so, and one of those places is around shelters um, and housing. Um, we have um, the type of housing that where we would call a shelter um, that's actually a temporary use in our code. Um, and so we definitely, we are embarking, um, we gotta get permission from council later this week, but we plan to embark um, on a project that will update that section of the development code so that we don't have to declare a winter emergency every year um, and the um, shelter can then operate year round. So that's sort of on the legal and regulatory side and probably not why you were asking the question, but that has to happen. Um, the other piece really becomes securing the facility, the building, um, the property, um, and then making sure that we have the service providers like Shepherd's House and, and their peers throughout the community um, available and make sure we have the funds available for them to run that shelter. So um, I can say that that has been definitely a change in direction from the Ben City Council in the last six months. Um, and I expect it to continue with the election of the new councilors um, that we will be taking more active roles in some of these property acquisition and management, managing the facility um, so that we can um, provide a place for service providers like John or others um, to operate shelters. So. We are looking at the current location um, as we should. Um, and then what are the other locations throughout Bend that ought to be um, considered for adding to the number of permanent shelter beds we have in the city of Bend. One of the questions become around the barriers related um, to those shelters. Um, we're all very familiar with Bethlehem Inn um, and the obligations of the families and individuals who, who are successful at Bethlehem Inn. Um, we would call that a high barrier shelter. Um, we know that we need more low barrier shelter beds in the city of Bend so that we have um, some of those initial interactions that John talked about, um, which is opening the door and getting people over the threshold for more intense um, service relationships. And so more low barrier shelter beds um, is definitely uh, the near term goal um, for the region, definitely for, for the city. Thank you, Carolyn. I see, let's see, Colleen, you just typed an answer to a question that I think people might want to hear here. What are the top three or four causes of homelessness from what you see there at Deschutes County? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I think it's really important. And again, coming back to what I said before is right, right those that are experiencing homelessness, we have to look at it as individualized. 
Um, but when we conduct the point in time count, we do ask what is the cause for homelessness? And oftentimes in the last couple of years, we have heard very, very frequently and very clear that inability to afford rent, family conflict or issues, meaning they were staying with family or friends and are unable to do so any longer. And then legal issues, whether that is um, personal legal issues revolving around um, probation or crimes that have uh, prohibited them to be able to find rentals as well. They're also, and again, I just like to highlight that it is all self-report when we ask these questions. So even though we may know someone that is experiencing a substance use disorder or a mental health diagnosis, they might not self-identify as that, but that is also a factor that um, we see quite a bit um, for those that are experiencing, especially chronic homelessness. Great, thank you, Colleen. John, I've got two can quick questions. Can oh, I just sorry. add something really quick to that? Um, when you talk about mental health and um, addiction services, one of the things that is very important to remember is in the state of Oregon, we are, if not the bottom in one of those two categories, the, very close to the bottom of access. And so we do not have beds um, for substance abuse treatment that we need and we do not have beds for mental health support. And so when people try and access mental health support and substance abuse treatment, we're 49th, 50th, and it is really hard um, for them. And that is something that we absolutely have to fix as a state if we're going to tackle this problem. And a lot of times those two problems are united. They need to be tackled together. Um, people with mental, mental illness is, issues will a lot of times try and self-medicate, um, which then becomes an addiction problem. And so I just really want to also highlight the fact that people don't have places to go in our state because we just don't have the services that are adequate for our, our population. Thanks. Sherry, thank you for raising that important point. John, a couple of quick questions about the shelter and operations. I've got a question asking, can kids show up as volunteers too with their family? And is there an age limit for being able to, to volunteer alongside you? We don't have a formal age limit. Our main requirement is that whoever brings the minors to volunteer at the shelter, they have to provide 100% supervision. And we'll normally have a short interview with them ahead of time just to make sure they understand the nature of the shelter and that they're comfortable with it, that, you know, that they're not surprised by a low barrier shelter when they arrive and that they're willing to take 100% responsibility. And we've had, we've had uh, younger folks come and volunteer and serve meals alongside their, their older members of their families, and it's been a good experience. So we've never had a problem with that so far. And we are willing to do it just as long as we're comfortable with the level of supervision that comes with it. Great, that makes sense. The second question I have here for you, John, is around um, security, uh, saying that people experiencing homelessness often express fear of losing their possessions. So how do you accomplish security there at the warming shelter? So we, we do it in a number of ways. We have staff monitors who are there the entire time that our guests are there. This year, and um, this is the first time I've worked with, we have actual professional security guards who are also there. Uh, we do tell the guests that they're responsible for whatever personal belongings they bring in. So we warn them that if they have valuables with them that they don't wanna lose, they need to take some steps to guard them. Uh, for example, if you have a wallet, it's best to keep the wallet in your pocket and never take it out even when you're sleeping. Um, these are things, so far we haven't had an accusation of theft from one guest to another. Um, so that's, we've been successful with that. The other thing we do is we do let guests keep personal items in a tote and leave them there for the day. But that goes hand in hand with our rule that all the guests leave, we lock the doors and then they all come back together at night. So there's nobody in the building except for one or two staff members, usually myself and one other staff person so that there, it's not as if there are people moving among the personal belongings with an opportunity to take them. Uh, they, I will tell you our guests, you know, we'll have guests come with shopping carts and, and other carts. And sometimes depending on the nature of them, we'll let them bring them inside. Sometimes it's just too much, but we'll tell them bring in whatever valuables you wanna guard with you because they know it's much safer 
being with them in their sleeping area where they will be 90% of the time and where there will be somebody watching 100% of the time than if they just leave them outside, even if they try to hide them. So that's, we don't have a 100% foolproof method of, of preventing you know, somebody from taking something, but so far we've been successful with that basic approach. Great, thank you. Carolyn, a question for you about um, community development block grant funds. What can we do on a federal level to adjust the allotment to put more into services? Um, okay, so I'll take a step back and try to. So community development block grant, affectionately known as CDBG, um, are direct allocations that the city of Bend receives from HUD on an annual basis. Um, that allocation is largely based on the age of our housing stock. Um, there's some things around population, there's some things around um, other attributes of our community, but largely based on our housing stock. Because when someone decided this back in the 50s, um, it was older housing that needed to be rehabilitated to be inhabited by those at the lowest income levels. And so for communities that have older housing stock, um, I am really simplifying this. If there's an expert in the audience, you can text me later and tell me I didn't do it well. But, um, but basically, um, that's where our $500,000 um, that we get annually comes from. Um, that is changing now, um, and we would fully expect with the next Congress that that, you know, that total allocation to CDBG would get bigger, so we would get the same percentage of that, of that bigger pie. Um, we did see some additional funds come in um, directly related to COVID, and we would expect to see more of those. Um, and to traditionally a very small portion of the total allocation that the city of Bend receives is allowed to go for services. Um, and so we did, we would use those funds, they would go to John so, and Shepherd's House so they could open the winter warming shelter with the additional funds that we got um, related to COVID and the, and the care stimulus um, package back um, in the late spring we were able to allocate $650,000 in service dollars um, to Shepherd's House to run the warming shelter. They took the limits off the public, the program services um, off the allocation that time around. So it opened up a lot more funds for um, program services. So really we're dealing, it, it really just becomes a mathematical equation. We as an entitlement committee only get a certain amount of money. And then the law says that only a certain amount of that money can go to program services. Um, will that change um, from the federal level as we learn more and more about homelessness, perhaps, but you have to remember we're competing with Atlanta and Chicago, um, and they don't want the allocation changed because they have older housing stock that needs to be converted and to address um, the issues that they're facing in those communities. So um, the real way that we've approached it um, is mo most recently, really just in December, kind of a phenomenal act by council to add a special meeting at the end of December um, to approve some additional funding um, that can be allocated to homeless services um, and other housing related services um, beyond what we do around construction. Um, and so with regard to federal money, um, it's I'm not, I wouldn't be putting my eggs in the federal allocation basket changing. Um, but I do think we need to think uh, more about um, how we fund these types of services throughout our community. Some of that's relying on the state, um, some of that's relying on the county, um, and some of that is rely definitely relying on foundation and private donations um, to meet the needs of the service provision, the people. Um, really, that's what it comes down to, the staffing and the expertise of the case managers and the volunteers um, who work for our professional social service agencies to continue to provide service, um, including overnight stays at shelters um, and those types of services. Thanks, Carolyn. That's not a that's not an easy subject to tackle here on, on a webinar. I'm seeing a couple of questions related to capacity. So what is the current capacity for shelters? What is the gap that we're seeing? How many folks are turned away and what's really the variety of the kinds of different housing that we need to see here in Central Oregon? And who would like to, to take a stab at that first? I think you're John, on mute, yeah. John. Sorry about that. Thank you. So at the Ben Winter Shelter, we haven't turned away anybody yet because we're over capacity. We know that we 
were given a certain number around 60 by the fire marshal for sleeping overnight, but he also said that we have some leeway for keeping people warm. In other words, even if they're not overnight sleeping guests, we could bring more people into the building at night to keep them warm. Now, I haven't, you know, I, I don't think we've really come up against that problem yet. We don't know exactly what our number is yet because we haven't gotten to the point where we've seen we're too crowded to, that we can't take any more people in. Um, but I'll say this, there are a lot of people who don't use the shelter every night. We've had almost 250 different individuals come through our doors. I think the highest number of guests we've had so far is around 60 to 65. Um, so there are people out there who are not using a shelter every night. And I think it's for, it, it's for personal reasons. It could just be the rhythms of their own personal life and where it takes them. I also think there is an issue with people who are camping and, and wanting to keep their possessions in their own home, their own camp, where they're with a certain group of friends who they know will help them watch their possessions. They have too many possessions to bring into the shelter. They have a whole camp full of possessions. We can't have 65 camps come into the shelter every night. We can't fit them. Um, so they, they're aware of that and they know if they come, that's just what they can carry or maybe roll in in a cart. But otherwise they wanna maintain the life that they have outside because to them that is the closest thing they have to a home or a place to belong. Um, so there is, a shelter is one part, a low barrier shelter is one part, a more focused, more programmatic transitional housing, such as the Shepherd's House Men's and Women's Center is another part for people who are willing to make a long-term commitment to, to changing their lives, because that's what those two centers require in order for those folks to be successful there. Uh, then there's something even lower barrier than our shelter, which are people who are camping and don't want to come into a shelter where they're subject to other people's regulations. And I think that is a very large challenge. How do you connect with those folks in a way that they're just not always on the fringe and somehow feel they're at odds with the society they're living in, right? Because that's like the least level of connection to the folks who are just out there camping on the outskirts and usually are trying to avoid other people even knowing that they're there. So I don't know the number of those people. There are some folks who say, you know, there's a couple of hundred here, a hundred there. I can't speak to the accuracy of those numbers, but I know it's an issue because we see the camps and we see that when shelters close, those camps increase in number and become more visible. So that's, that, that's about my input on that. Thank you. Sherry or Colleen, did you have any additional thoughts regarding capacity? Um, I would like to add about our homeless unaccompanied youth population. Um, we have about 4,000 homeless unaccompanied youth in the state of Oregon. And um, I think on Carolyn's slide, she had our point in time count was 54 uh, for Central Oregon. But each one of those um, homeless unaccompanied youth get about 92 cents a day from the state of Oregon. And the funding is severely underfunded. The services are underfunded. And that adds another dynamic, right? If you're younger and you have no adults with you, where do you go to shelters? And we have um, places where they can go here with the loft and J-Bar-J um, that help our homeless unaccompanied youth. But we have to find some funding to get in there. And the last day of my legislative career, we got a million dollars put into funds for homeless unaccompanied youth, but it's clearly not enough. And so we have all these different definitions, uh, different types of shelters. Um, I hope you're all taking notes because we've given you a lot of information on low barrier and high barrier and wraparound services. But um, the reality is we need a lot of different types of shelter beds because again, to my original point, these are individuals. These are Sue and John and Bob and Jeff, and we need to make sure we can meet their needs, right? And it's not easy to meet their needs with one type of shelter. So getting it down to who needs help is an even harder question because how many people are on a couch that they've been on six different couches this month um, that have hid from all of this? 
and we don't know they're there. So there's a lot of different spaces. The, the kids that are leaving home without their parents, the families that are moving in with their other families. Um, I, I think there's a lot of different issues and different funding trains and funding streams. One of the things I think has been most helpful is um, our city councilor Bruce Abernathy, who is a grant writer, who is able to write us grants from multiple different sources to help our homeless population. And the last grant that I'm aware of, and Bruce, I apologize if this is wrong, um, was he worked on the uh, Veterans Village to get grants for veterans. And so that's another different type of shelter that you can fit into or not, but we need all those different options. And I think options are gonna be very important in this. And um, knowing that our data and our numbers are never really going to capture the whole picture, but we need to make sure that we have different options and funds. Thanks. Great, thanks. Colleen, did you have something you wanted to add? I was just going to say, and I think you hit it, um, Sherry and John, is, you know, we look at a housing continuum, right? We need uh, increase in capacity for all levels of shelter beds um, and housing resources, whether that is what John alluded to of a designated um, camp, that that is where the individuals feel most um, safe and comforted, um, and that is what they they need all the way up to permanent supportive housing and multifamily units. So we have to look at it as a spectrum and there's not a one size fits all. And so look really working together with the community in the city um, and those that are doing the work to identify what those um, different housing opportunities are. Thank you. So I see we're running close to the end of our time. I have so many more questions here that people have, but maybe let's end on um, a proactive note. This person says it probably seems like a simple question, but if you encounter a person experiencing homeless, how can you direct them to resources? Are there printed resource lists available or something that people could have in their cars and, and on their person as they're encountering people? I think a great resource, and that's a plug, we are in the process of um, revamping the Homeless Leadership Coalition website, but on that website, we do have a list of different resources, including shelter beds, um, different places for um, meals and different things like that. Um, and there should be some printable versions um, as well. So that is cohomeless.org. Um, there's also the Deschutes County um, directory or resource directory um, that was started in the beginning of uh, the COVID pandemic that um, is available online as well and should have updated resources across our region. And, and Colleen, I just want to add, so one way too is um, to let someone from the Homeless Leadership Coalition know that you, you, you encountered someone. Um, they very likely, the service providers already are familiar with the individual who you have just encountered. So we have service providers who are going out on a regular basis up to Juniper Ridge and out to China Hat and on Hunnell Road. The, um, many of those members of our community are already known to our service providers. So um, it may not, you don't necessarily even ha have to have, you know, if it's something you're not comfortable with, you can call and let us know about um, that individual who you saw. Um, and we there's also a way to um, have us, you know, go out and find that individual too. So um, I think one of the big misconceptions that I learned as I, jumped in with both feet in the fall into this um, is that the service providers are out there and, and know many of the people um, by name and exactly where they spend their nights and where they leave their things. Um, and so recognizing that a lot of that service is being provided. So um, be rest assured um, that many individuals are getting contacted and anything you can do to continue those connections would be really, really terrific. So thanks for the question. 211. Um, if you dial 211 on your phone, you can get directed to services. And that's a real easy um, way to direct people. Oh, um, one thing that I would say, a lot of homeless do have a phone um, and are able to connect. And um, 211 is, is a great resource that you can direct people to as well. And for anyone who just has their feet and aren't really sure what question to ask, you could just send them to the Shepherd's House Men's Center on Division Street, there's usually staff and almost always a knowledgeable resident who could at least help them, guide, who could help guide them in their search for whatever. If it, even if it's something we don't offer, we could help them connect with whoever does offer it. So that's another possibility. 
Thank you. And we'll make sure we include those resources that were just mentioned in the follow-up email that you receive later today. So given that it's one o'clock now, this was a fascinating discussion. I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for tuning in and asking such thoughtful questions. As a reminder, we will send out the recording of this webinar so you can see it later if you had to miss part or if you'd like to share it with friends or family. And then also any additional resources that our panelists have for you to further your education and your awareness. And then once again, none of this would be possible without the support of our sponsor, Ben Broadband. Thanks to all of you, please be well.